right? I guess the hardest part about it is where you start. That's it. That's what <laughs> I'm wondering. Because I was wondering um, if I would do an introduction or I would just cut in at a random start. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you necessarily need to do an introduction and try and make it like as natural as possible, isn't it? Just There's that. nothing more natural than literally talking about it. So yeah. that will be where it is. I yeah. want to... Opening we... stock question, isn't it? Just start with like, hey, what what you been up to? <laughs> Pretty much. But also, we, I, what we have to, because at the time recording, all of 30 minutes ago, a big uh, thing happened in mm-hmm. this country. I presume you've seen, of course, the cancellation of Manifest. I have, indeed. Mm. I was surprised. To be honest, yeah. it seemed. I don't know if I was surprised or not, because it's hard to say if you're surprised, right? Because I, I, I don't follow a lot of the smaller festivals as much as I'd like to. Reality of it is, is that some of the times they're just. I want to. Yeah, you know, we spoke about manifest. I, I love the lineup. I'd love to go. It's just on a weekend that I can't. You know, that's mm. that's just the way it is. Festival like that later in the summer, you know, I'm all over it. But I also understand why that maybe that's difficult to book. But you know, it's a uh, coming up pretty soon. And it also happens to clash with what well, appears to be quite a few week um, festivals that all try and try and kind of get that bank holiday weekend. You know, one particularly big one in uh, Slammed Up. Yeah. So you know, that's... I don't know, man. Like, it's hard to say if you're surprised or not. The thing that surprises me about these things because this is the second one, but I, I was trying to remember the other one that I saw a couple of days back. Was it like Dominion? Dominion. Or... Yeah. Dominion. So I see these two, like like obviously the one that you said a couple or a very, very short period of time ago. Um, and Dominion, I think I saw that like maybe two, three days ago or something like that. And then I don't know if I'm surprised or not. The bit that surprises me is that like whether you love music, whether you're a fan, whatever it may be, it's still technically a business. Yeah. And all businesses usually are costed. And this is the thing, I like I'm not trying to be like a Oh, it's metal, man. Don't cost a thing. I, you know what I mean, like it doesn't work, mm. work that way. Like, you know, oh, you know, fuck the system. So we just don't even cost our, our, our things. And I don't understand. Like, if you launch a business, you have to fully cost it. You have to get funding. You have to do all this sort of stuff. And to me, like, sometimes these are almost treated like a labor of love, which is a beautiful thing, but just not fiscally responsible. I build it and they will come. Attitude. I think that's the hope, isn't it? You know, you get like the big enough lineup on it, then people are going to come. I that, don't... Def- that definitely, what you're saying there, that what we're saying there is definitely something I think I think for Dominion, maybe more than Manifest, because Dominion mm. was very much a lineup that seemed to be built way before, as we found out, 5% ticket sales, 5% of the need yeah. of tickets is insane. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and uh, we, we, we both classify <laughs> ourselves, obviously, as lovers of heavy metal. Uh, I didn't have tickets to either one. That's not like a diss to them or anything like that. That's just the nice. you know, the way it is, isn't it? You know, um, I think it's sad and I think it's a shame that the tickets haven't sold. But I also just don't think it's like it clearly is a model that doesn't work. Right. That's the thing. Right. You know, both of these festivals, you correct me if I'm wrong here, but Dominion as well wasn't like a one day or anything like that. It was like a full on, you know, th- and that to me is like a big commitment right when you're trying to get mm-hmm. a festival off the ground if you look at the examples of the ones that have been successful outside of the ones that were funded by the likes of you know metal hammer and kerrang and all that sort of stuff bloodstock is your best example and bloodstock was a small indoor festival uh for many years actually many many yeah. years and grew like almost like evolved rather than you know sort of forced growth you know it was like an evolution you know and it, and it was done over time um I don't know the exact dates. I'm sure plenty of people will, but from what I understand, they were indoors for like a good best part of a decade, almost like seven, eight years, you know? I think it was around that, yeah. So, and then I don't know the history behind all these festivals, but you kind of see like a festival pop up now and it's going like, I'm, I'm going to go straight in for a three day. I'm going to get all these bands in. It just seems like a massive commitment when mm. if you're trying to get something off the ground, what you tend to do is start with smaller runs and like test the waters a little bit. I can see things like this. So being a madly like not a gap in the market, but room in the market for um loads of one dayers. You know what I mean? Like one day is a are a thing, like a nice sort of dip your toe in the water. There's not going to be as much of an upfront cost and investment and everything like that. And you grow your fan base, right? You grow the appetite for it. You get good feedback from the people for the one day as so maybe 
a uh, couple of years down the line, you're still a one day, but in a bigger venue. And then maybe you have a half day before the one day and then, you know, seven, eight years down the line, what you've got tickets selling out every single year and you go, right, let's, let's, let's have a crack at it. Let's, let's go three days or whatever. I just don't really understand the logic in at a time like, like now where it's not just about money. It's not about any of that stuff. It's also about, in my honest opinion, market saturation of both music uh, of genres and of potential events you know that i just think like to go in and like have this huge sort of festival even though they were good prices good lineups as well you know strong lineups on all yeah. counts it's still like people you, you sort of everyone's sort of fighting each other right like everyone's like oh we're gonna run a festival we're gonna run a festival we're gonna run a festival everyone's doing festivals you know, then you've got the big festivals all coming up that people are putting money aside for. Now you've got more and more people that it seems are like willing to say travel into mainland Europe or whatever yeah. and um, experience something outside of the UK. You've got a lot of bands this year, I, th I think, kind of making up for the last couple of years, you know, like cancel tours and stuff like that. You know, there's been a lot of big bands playing mm. over uh, the UK, you know, like been to Wembley Arena a few times, seeing bands that we haven't seen for a while. So I don't know, it just feels to me like every time there's a gig on, whereas in the past that might be like, oh, that's really cool. I haven't been to a show for a couple of weeks. Now it's almost like, oh, cool. There's, so there's 42 gigs I could go to next month, which which four or five can I go to? Yeah. Then the other 38 are all like, oh, we're not selling enough tickets. And it's like, I don't know, it's hard, isn't it? It just feels to me like it feels saturated. Mm. Every part of it at the moment, gigs, music, the amount of albums being released, the amount of new bands forming, it feels like it's saturated. And actually, it's hindering the quality, right? Because Manifest might have turned out to be a true, truly mar marvellous festival, like an absolutely wonderful festival that grew and, and it's brilliant. But unfortunately, if a market is saturated, nobody wins. Yeah. You know, that's just the reality. Of you. you know, you put 10 bands in 10 venues and you're going to get 10 people in each one rather than a couple of bands and a couple of venues and get 50 people on each one. It's just, it's just statistics, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you talk about saturation. It's something I actually, yeah, I, I could really jump in on there as well, particularly from an album review point. It really hit me actually today when, um, you know, wrapping up uh, this week's set of reviews that would be out before the release uh, of the, uh, the, the new release date, which has time of recording, is tomorrow morning. And I would always go to our email account and I will clear that date and remove it. So we move on to the next one. And I went to that section, April, whatever it's 21st. And uh, there must be 30, 30 to 40 albums that we just couldn't cover. And that's with a full, yeah. busy schedule as per usual. 30 to yeah. 40 in one week that we couldn't cover. I'm like, I was like, we, I've never seen it that to... bad. I mean, never mind writing them, but like even just posting them, you would have to be posting a review every half an hour to cover mm. the amount of albums that are released each week. And that doesn't like, include singles one as well. The other. And that doesn't include and who reads singles. That? That's the thing. Who who get like you know like that's the thing because everything becomes saturated, right? We get as many in as and we we try to cover as many as we possibly can. Um, but even by that, we're saturating ourselves because yeah. if you post twenty articles a day, then no one has time to read all 20 so you kind of you're spreading your readership out over 20 articles rather than three or four focused articles do you know what i mean mm. so you know yeah and the the thing that blows me away with the email side of things is that like i i know it's not always the same and there are definitely peaks and troughs like um there's like tends to be you know a week or so before christmas where maybe it there's not such a heavy release and then the first couple of weeks of jan it goes fucking ballistic yeah you know as everyone's trying to get in there they're their first albums and EPs of the year. But what always blows my mind about it is, is that say you get 60 emails come through for album reviews, or mm. it might be album and EP reviews. Um, probably not all the time, but a lot of the time, 65, 70% of that are brand new band or debut or, or, or whatever. And you just think like, if we are going to form 60 brand new bands a week, like who's winning out of this, <laughs> you know? Yeah, then you break, then we go into like the genre saturation as well. Not yeah. that I, and I, I've got, you know, I've got no beef with any particular genre. I will cover pretty much anything depending upon my feeling or if I think it, it's worth doing and it fits the site nicely or it's just something that's going to be fun for me. But I, I will admit, 
I will admit to kind of now occasionally rolling my eyes when I see a new band, new album, new EP, whatever. And it's like post hardcore, post hardcore, alt yeah. post hardcore. And it's like another one. Oh yeah. my God, guys, this is becoming the new, new metal. And you know what I mean? And there's plenty of great bands. There are plenty of great bands, but I said this to Dan the other day. I'm generally getting worried that with that saturation of that genre specifically, that good bands are now just getting buried on a mountain of average bands yeah. because they're all very good at what they do, but because there's so much of it, it gets turned off and you're like, I don't want to do another one. I'm like, I, I, know, I didn't think this would happen, but like, I almost get like a sigh of relief when someone's like, hey, this is an old school 80s style death metal record. I'm like, fucking hey, let's yeah. do this. Yeah, and I, I'd imagine like I I I definitely um agree with the comparison to new metal because like obviously sound aside, of course I, I feel like this is just a I, I don't want to say like sound like a parent and say a phase, but it's almost like a turn of the wheel as such. I don't mean a phase as in oh people will stop making music or whatever. I just mean the cycle. All the, the things that cycle. happened in new metal are what's happening now, right? If you oversaturate the market with one genre because like it's currently, I guess the I'm not trying to say all this stuff without sound like an old man. <laughs> you know, it's currently <laughs> the music of the youth of metal. Like the people that are kind of younger and coming into it are very much that's their thing. And actually, when I yeah. was younger, that was also what new metal was doing, right? Yeah. I didn't really realize it at the time, but I never really considered that when if new metal was doing so well and that's what all the younger people were listening to, and it was eventually it pays dividends for other bands in that, you know, maybe over time they grow to appreciate other things and and, and whatnot. But I guess, what about the, all the other bands that weren't new metal at the time? How much were they suffering, right? So if you imagine right now, this is just a, a kind of a hypothetical question. Most businesses in the world, whatever you're doing, yeah, you kind of judge it on how the market is right now, mm -hmm. yeah? So if the market at the moment is young people are into the core sort of si sound of things, if you put on a one-day festival that's got, for example, soil work, overkill bands like that on it or you put a one day festival on that's got 10 up and coming hardcore slash deathcore bands there which one's going to sell well because interesting which are the ones with potentially I, I don't even know if this is accurate it's just what like ran like random thoughts you know i'm thinking all right so the people that might want to go and see overkill often will also be the people with maybe more financial commitments and uh kids and whatnot and i'm not saying Thanks. that yeah, I'm not saying it's definitely that. I'm just saying potentially. You know, when I want to go to a gig, I have to weigh up 75 different fucking factors mm. <laughs> to decide if I can go, you know, babysitters, all this sort of stuff. You know, when I was younger, I didn't. If I wanted to go, I just went somewhere. Yeah, I didn't of have those commitments. So I guess if you're, if you, um, and, now, and I don't want people to do this because enough with the hardcore already, man. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you want to start up a festival for the first time now, if you weren't into music, but you were doing this as a business opportunity, what would you put on? That's the thing. What's the hot ticket right now is kind of how it works. So I don't know. It's difficult. I I, I just, the whole sort of um, new metal cycle eventually kind of ended. And then bands that were new metal that were good still existed to a degree. Of course. Yep. And, Some, and yeah. That will likely happen again. I mean, it's not even like it's just new metal and hardcore. I would argue that metalcore in general, first, yeah. And that was really that everyone's doing bloody metalcore. Yeah, that and was the that first. Kind of faded away. And the bands that were big in metalcore are still around today, but even they had to tweak their sound to stay relevant. Mm. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if in one, two, five years, I don't know when it will be, the bigger ha hardcore bands who are five or six albums in now are also now evolving and wanting to tweak their sounds. Yep. And then something will come next, you know? There'll always be another, I don't know, it's not a fad as such, because I do get that people love it, you know, but there'll be another thing, won't there? It's, like it's trash, trash in the 80s, man. Like, do you know what I mean? It's cycles. You're absolutely right. It's cycles and it, it, it all makes complete sense to me. I, you know, it's it's a mad, it's a mad experience. And of course, this, you know, this failure, go back to the original thing, Dominion and Manifest. Dominion, I, I wanted to sort of mention briefly about that is um, and like I said we take there's no pleasure, there's no an analyzing, we don't know why and how, other than Dominion saying they had low ticket sales. Manifest has pretty much said the same thing in a statement that you can read online, including Facebook Live. You can go watch that back to uh, get the information there. 
But with the Dominion thing, one of the things I really, really uh, I noticed was I'd heard of it, but that was about it. And it was like, wow, this either didn't get a reach it needed to on social media and so on. It wasn't promoted well. And that was a notable thing for me. But I can't say the same for Manifest. However, I'm not sure that's technically true because I was paying a bit more attention to Manifest. Then, and obviously when you pay attention to something in social media, you will get yeah social, yeah that stuff i think so and oh. i think like but you know the thing i have seen genuinely seen manifest kind of paid ads on facebook um i'm pretty sure i've seen that but okay. the thing that i noticed that the, the where i've noticed manifest the most is as marketing by the bands that were playing themselves i've seen ghosts of atlantis other bands like that regularly yeah. posting you know here's where we're playing the next couple of months with manifest pushing it like you'd want the bands to do but like yes. you said with dominion i don't even know if i was aware of the festival to be honest i might have maybe recognized the name or something like that but i certainly haven't seen like a big push on it mm. however it's hard to know whether that's their fault or not because we also know that social media and algorithms can kill you and i guess if you're already struggling for ticket sales constantly investing more and more and more money into paying for paid ads and stuff like that becomes a tough decision to make you know mm. but the bands that were playing um dominion fest i i follow a lot of these bands on social media i don't really remember seeing any of them like post from them sort of pushing it even blind guardian i saw one i can i saw one from blind guardian where it was basically these are our shows throughout the year and so on and it was yeah. part of that yeah but that's but yeah that's so loads <laughs> no that's not no nah. So yeah, look. I mean, I feel I feel sorry for them too. I'm not saying that I don't. I do. I think it of sucks, course. man. And I think it it would have been great to have a few more things going on. But you know, I just at the same time, I just I feel like I don't understand why it's a surprise because everything should be costed. And I do understand that, like, um, you know, like it, it, the more you kind of try and add, so you know, it's costed for a day. You do a second day, a third day. Your bands get bigger. The costs are going higher and higher and higher. So there must be a mark that they have to sell to, to at least break even, you know, how many mm -hmm. tickets do I need to sell to break even? Um, if it was truly only 5% of tickets sold, and there's no reason to doubt them, you know, that's of what course. I said, then that I would imagine like you, pr I don't know the numbers. I, if I was guessing, I would say you probably need to sell somewhere between 60 and 70% of your tickets to break even, maybe mm -hmm. more, maybe more. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're at 5% now, that means that, over the last six months, you've also been at 4%, 3% or, or whatever. The only negative I would say to all these festivals is like how last minute these cancellations seem to come at. I mm. think it would be very easy to see in terms of trending. You know, if we're not pumping any more money into marketing, we're not pumping any more money into social media. Our current ticket sales are at 3% and it's three months to go. Are we going to get to 70, 80% realistically? Mm most people will probably be able to say the answer is no. So I don't know. How do you suddenly sell 65% of your tickets we, with on, in week five? That, that's you, the if, thing. So It's impossible. You know it's impossible. Maybe it's wishful it's thinking. Maybe it's optimism. Or maybe it's just hope. And, you know, that's, that mm. I can't diss. I can understand them sitting there and just thinking, like, maybe we give it one more payday. Let's, you know, maybe we'll, we'll have a massive influx. But I guess if you bought a ticket there, look, they all seem to be doing what they can for refunds. The thing that always hurts people done it is... Um, hotels travel you know the likes of that yep yeah and then we get ripped off further because then what happens then is that everybody like your big ticket people sellers and all that go oh now we better give them the extra six quid for that ticket insurance <laughs> there is it's uh ba basically everybody loses um you know i understand as well that this is the end of the company behind oh, manifest as well yeah it is not like uh that's a shame it is a shame man but I don't know, you know, these sorts of things, I think, like, look, if you, maybe they want to come one day, come back, but I just think, like, set your ambitions lower. Yeah. Make don't, yourself a stable business. And don't then... run before you can walk, man. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's it. I think that's all we can really say to it. We're not experts in this field. We're just people. And they say, neither of us had tickets to these events, but it's not through lack of desire. We talked about uh, Manifest in particular. Um, and as you say, we are, we good. one thing that I was talking to my wife about it was, I often see a lot of these things occurring well out of our range. Uh, so for us to, because we're in London, for us to go do these things, it is obviously travel plans. It is hotels. Yep. It is cost and stuff like that, which, you know, uh, you know, we can do in some circumstances and all that, but obviously as well, just like anybody else, it's time off work. 
it's arrangements for example as i said with you you know you've got a young daughter who needs yeah. babysitting looking after and things like that you've got a dog that needs caring for all these things have to come into account yeah. so it simply falls apart particularly when you've got an option that's close to the home that suits and fits around not just your life but your family and so on um yeah it's not through lack of desire it's just lack of ability yeah that's what it is and that'll be the same for a lot of people yeah you know it, yeah so like yeah like you said a sad thing it's happened in some ways and now I'm, I'm trying to take a positive out of a negative if i don't know sometimes like i guess for other festivals that have managed to go ahead it can maybe provide them a boost to make them more financially stable because people that were hoping to get somewhere else uh to get to a festival around that time will have to look elsewhere yeah you know yeah because downloads now sold out uh bloodstock will likely hit that mark at some point yeah. before it starts as well so they're the big 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 uh Boys and girls out of the way, you know, think people you got damnation later in the year and damnation is very upfront about its costs and obviously uh, what yep. they need to do to survive and keep going. So, you know, yep. it's kind of follow that. Plenty, 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 plenty to come, no doubt as well, particularly as I say, I think you're right in the one day department and so on. Of course, folks, if you do have a festival, a one day festival or whatever, and you want us to talk about it, let us know. Mm. Send an email. We'll post about it. We'll try and share it. We'll try and talk yep. about it as much as we possibly can. Don't depend um, on Facebook. Yes, 100%. Uh, what else has been going on? Actually, I know I wanted you to talk about something. I was like, yep, I'll ask Brendan about this. And you can talk about it because, well, of course, you've written about it. Speaking about it, it's two different ah. things. You went to a big gig and saw three different <laughs> bands. Diff- different, but <laughs> I- I- arena bands, right? You know, I guess I- even band number one. If I was ever going to see them, it's likely to be at something like this rather than a ticket I bought. So uh, the Ovo Arena, hard mm. to find out to say, Wembley Arena. That's the, the one. Rest, to the rest of us. Um, and this was to see Lordy, Baby Metal and Sabaton, of course, with Ooh. the main priority being for Sabaton. You know, not going to pretend. The ticket was bought on the basis of Sabaton. Whether any other bands that I knew were there or not, we still would have bought the tickets because talk about how you sell tickets what a fucking bargain price this ticket was man well so, how much was it well the tickets were only 40 40 quid at wembley arena for what to some people would be three huge bands like to me it was like 40 quid for sabaton at wembley arena that's a fucking bargain imagine if you also love baby metal and lordy i mean you know wembley arena arena the word means higher cost right yeah. And what I f- found absolutely astonishing, there, and obviously there's booking fees and all that sort of stuff. So you're probably coming in at around 45, 48 quid, something like that anyway. You know, uh, price of a t-shirt, 40 quid. Ah, you know, and I'm not complaining about that, but I just thought it was hilarious that the ticket was the same price as a t-shirt. No, I think we should complain about 40 pound, 40. And, that, and I'm going to presume, I, I mean, we don't know this for sure, but I'm going to take a wild punt. That a venue like Wembley Arena, the oh, Ovo yeah. Arena, is taking a merch cut. That's exactly what we we were saying. That's what we were looking at it and saying, like, you know, look, 40 quid for a T-shirt. There was selling, like, baby metal hoodies there for 75 quid. Oh. Do you know what I mean? Like, so, and, and it weren't even, like, um, and it is probably potentially even venue set because all T-shirts were 40 quid. So Lordy, Baby Metal, and Sabaton. Or at least the oh. ones that I saw. I'm pretty sure, I don't remember now. I'm trying to remember if I saw Lordy t shirts, but the baby metal and the Sabaton ones were definitely because I had to purchase some of them. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, so look, I mean, wait, you would have bought a baby metal t shirt. Sorry, you'd have bought a baby metal t shirt. Yes. Ah! Amazing. <laughs> I, no, 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 worse, 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 actually. I had to buy a baby metal hoodie. Ah! That's how I know that. That's how I know there were 75 fucking pounds. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> but yeah, I think I spent 200 and I spent two and a half hundred easy on merch there because I bought. Myself a Sabaton t-shirt. They're such a good range of t-shirts, Carl. It's fucking yeah. awesome. Specialist ones, some for the date, for the Wembley Arena. Uh, some like just new designs done. So it was really kind of cool as well to see. It wasn't just like, oh, look, there's some fr- with a Sabaton album from 10 years ago that they've just found. Oh, we found this in the, I don't know, the storage or whatever. <laughs> nice. You know, um, Bolt, the Mrs. The Sabaton t-shirt. Rose, the Sabaton t-shirt. She also... She didn't ask for it, but she was she was looking at the baby metal hoodie, so I picked her that up. Uh, and then because I had too much merch to carry, I then paid ten quid for a Sabaton bag to put all the merch in, <laughs> like a canvas did, bag or whatever. You they know, did so. you, man? <laughs> they did me, yeah. I did all that. But you know, like a look, I realistically take the price of the t-shirt. Out. If you're if I'm paying forty quid a ticket, to me, I value that gig differently. I like you know because uh, 
I didn't right, Lordy. Let's let's talk about Lordy. You know who Lordy are. I, I know who Lordy are. I am in the camp of I don't listen to Lordy, but I do know that Eurovision song. <laughs> yeah. And and that to a diehard Lordy fan probably means complete and utter dickhead. Yeah. Yes. And I accept that. I, I agree. I am. Um and but what I also thought was absolutely wonderful about Lordy is that they embraced it totally, kind of like joking with the crowd about no, no, it's not that song yet, you know. <laughs> that sort of stuff but i thought you know what if you got if why not you probably did all right out of it you know like have a bit of fun with it um good humored band visually kind of cool to watch musically i mean kind of odd right because i can't help but look at lordy and think wow yeah you know that's that's probably unfair on them but that's what I, that's what i do i go oh, look it's Squaw. um they're really not even a metal band Right, they play rock music, like rock and roll mm. slash hard rock at, at, on occasion. But I mean, they're fun. They were fun. I, I I thoroughly enjoyed watching them. I enjoyed the song that I knew, but I enjoyed the songs I didn't know, and it was just good fun. It was like, yeah, you know what? These these are great. I wouldn't pay forty quid to go and see Lordy. That's I still wouldn't now, but I would certainly not shy away from them if they're at a festival or something like that. In fact, probably mm. the opposite. I'd be like, oh, they're pretty close to, you know, nothing else being on you've got to go and check out a bit of Lordy because it'll just put you in a good spirit, I think. Fair enough. Um, Baby Metal was a first time I've ever seen Baby Metal. Um, I've heard from you and from other people that even though I don't enjoy them, I might enjoy the live kind of experience with them. Uh, I didn't really. That's not much. I didn't hate it. Mm -hmm. Um, I just didn't really love it. And actually it was during Baby Metal after a few songs that I went and queued for the merch. Not a bad time, back. really. No, nah, they came back up and caught the last couple of songs as well. Uh, big crowd for them, lots of cheers, you know, people going ballistic in the seats around me and all that sort of stuff. And I'm not talking children, I'm talking full grown men with beards. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it's baby metal. And I'm just like, okay, Rose. Rose <laughs> my armor. But but look, you know, they're into it, so like fair enough, right? I really I don't know, it's because I'm a it's because I'm a knobhead. That's all it is. It's nothing wrong with them. They didn't do anything wrong, they sounded good, the sound was great, very loud plenty of high energy heavy music i just struggled to watch it because i didn't like all the silly choreographed dancing on stage and mm. I, I was like this is the most manufactured metal i've ever and i i, I was grown up in an era where we were, we, we used to laugh at lincoln park because people started a rumor that they were manufactured and now i'm sitting here watching the three girls jumping around on stage doing choreographed moves um and then i think the first two songs there was about six words in total that got said right but look the thing with it is i'm glad i saw it I didn't hate it, uh, and I can appreciate why a lot of people would like it. But I'm also glad I saw it because it just kind of like firmed it up for me that yeah, they're like not really my cup of tea. That's it. It's also heavy on the electronica, man. Like really heavy. I mean, in the live environment where we were sitting, you couldn't always hear the vocals brilliantly, but you so you were getting blasted with like scratching and stuff like that, you know, on occasion. So or the electronic kind of tones. Now, obviously, well, they, they, well, they all have new albums out as well. That's the thing, right? In it, so maybe that would have made a difference because you know they I think they played like six, seven songs. They played a couple that I do know from other albums, like "Gimme Chocolate" and yep. "Papaya" or whatever. But they also played like a collection of like songs from the new album, which I, I I didn't know anything at all. So the other side of it, Rose loved it. I thought they were fantastic. That's the requirement for the hoodie. Yeah, I mean. You, you kind of nailed it there. People uh, always say, oh, well, you know, you see them live and you might feel differently. You've seen them live now. You can now mark down. You've heard on record. You've seen them live mm-hmm. um, outside of meeting them. Um, I don't know what else you can do. And even then, if you meet them, it's going to change necessarily a view on the music. No, I have a feeling it could be potentially be quite awkward if I... <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm not after an interview with uh, Baby. Before we move on to the other one, I wanted to... Uh, ask you this question right so uh baby metal have announced um a run a short run of intimate dates in the uk right. intimate dates um we got the email about it and i was like oh wow I wonder where they're gonna be playing and stuff like that where do you reckon baby metals intimate dates are in london in london i mean firstly i hope it isn't actually genuinely anywhere intimate because i don't think that music will work in a small venue if mm-hmm. i'm guessing uh let's go electric ballroom you're thinking way too small because I went oh, into metal. Really? Okay. Yeah. I was I was gonna go smaller and then I thought, nah, nah, ballroom might be a good one. So we're going roundhouse then. 
That's you nailed it. Yeah. Two nights that's not in intimate. the roundhouse. Two, <laughs> no, two nights in the roundhouse and call that intimate. I mm. laughed. All right, fair enough. They're an arena band. So fair enough. It's smaller and it'll be packed out, hence the two nights. Yeah. But when I saw intimate, scroll down and saw roundhouse. I laughed. There was me in my head thinking, oh my God, a baby metal going to play the underworld. <laughs> and it's like, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. yeah. So Sabaton, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it was brilliant. It was absolutely phenomenal, and it was it was really quite special. I felt like, um, firstly, right, there is a lot of um, personal kind of emotions of these things because what I'm doing is I'm bringing my daughter to see bands for the first time, right? Mm-hmm. That that adds an extra special layer to it. Um, as long as she comes out enjoying it, otherwise it ruins the whole fucking thing. And she's like, "Oh, this shit." <laughs> you know? That's unlikely, yeah. Yeah, it's unlikely, but um, you know, like I mean, just the whole experience, right? Firstly. Kind of, we we hung out in Wembley for a little bit, had a couple of drinks, had something to eat, went down there. The whole top end of the over arena, the Wembley arena, has got like the whole Sabaton thing lit up with all the band members like on in lights. The queue was phenomenal. There was a really positive vibe, you know. There was, it was sunny Ooh. as well when it? it was a nice weather on Saturday. There's it people was, like yeah. sitting out on their jackets in that um, you know, the kind of uh, open bit at the front of Wembley arena, like sort of picnicking with their um bags of off license beers. There's people in the crowd singing Sabaton songs, like in the mm. queue, all friendly, you know, people talking to each other, people high-fiving Rose Arsenal if she's looking forward to it. You know, it's just really, really nice buzz, which I think is cool because they're not the sort of, scow- they're not a scowly band, are they? Like, do you know what I mean? There's not, no one's yeah. trying to like Phil and Selmo the fuck out of this queue, man. Everyone's <laughs> just like in a good, good, positive vibe. You know, there were, as far as we are aware, and Sabaton did say that it's sold out. Right. It certainly looked and felt sold out. Yeah, because you could see the floor. Yeah. Uh, There's not yet. Well, I mean, I couldn't. That was the problem. <laughs> I, like, I'm sorry, I, could, I couldn't. I could see a, a ton of people, man. And like, mm. uh, you know, I'm talking like we, we were there not too long ago, weren't we, for Machine Head? And, um, you yeah, know, we sort of stood around about like near where the sound desk is. And it was okay behind us, right? It weren't ran behind us, but this was That's all right, the way yeah. back to the bar, man. There was people standing LA. alongside the bar, like trying to trying to see in, and it was quite cool, and I think quite special. And I think that might also give people an indication of the intelligent pricing, mm. because Sabaton gave us like a bit of a story halfway through. So I can't remember all the band members' names, but the guitarist that we interviewed actually up on the YouTube channel, if anyone wants to see the interview, when we interviewed him at Bloodstock, he came out to speak to us uh, near near the end of the show. And um, he said that he gave us, like, he they had like, on, so the, I mean, obviously you, you know there's going to be a lot of visuals, right? There's a lot of theatrics, okay? That's not a surprise. But they also had like a kind of screen uh, behind them as well that they were like showing things on. So during the songs, it was playing videos, um, as well as the big backdrops and all that. And yep. occasionally it would show the crowd. So you're kind of like looking back on each other. And then he had like a, almost like one of those sort of pen cams. And he showed like an itinerary that they'd kept from 20 years ago when they played their first ever show in the UK. Uh, yeah. it, it, sorry, the first ever show in London. And it was at a venue called the Purple Turtle. Oh, I remember the Purple Turtle. Became I recognized the, the um... name, but I couldn't remember where what it was. Oh, it became the Borderline. It became the oh, Borderline. Right. That place. So they played there 20 years ago. Um, they said they had a three by five stage, but the same amount of band members. And they also used to try and do theatrics back then. Uh, they, came, they He said, like, let's have a look at the itinerary. And it was like uh, car parking. No. Toilets for the band. No. Um, and it was just like this long list of like things you can't have. And he said, like, they ended up playing with like two members on the stage and everyone else standing at different points on the floor trying to play. They yeah. said it could have held, I think they said around 200 people. Uh, they sold something like 50 tickets. Um, so they came over, they played it, they had a good time, they learned a lot, they went back. Came back a few years later, played the Purple Turtle again. This time they sold 100 tickets. And he said, and that's what it's been like coming to London. He said, like, no, well, not in a horrible way. He said, you know, it's been hard. And at times we didn't know whether we would ever make it like yeah. out here. You know, which I think I've heard them say something similar to that before. Or you yeah, know, they've always they kind headlined. of acknowledged that. Yeah, yeah. you know, and he, and then he he got quite emotional. Really, it was quite beautiful. Like he 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 was like, the crowd started cheering him. He was getting very emotional, and he was sort of standing there with his hands in his face, and he was like, sold out Wembley. You know, and it was like this is like really fucking special. Um, he then asked everybody to turn the lights on on the phone. Uh, because they were going to do a song now and they everyone knew what it was going to be because he started like kind of introducing it and they were like 
usually in the song in the video we have snow but we have no snow so let's see if we can oh. recreate the snow right so all the lights are on the ca- the screen behind him is now showing the lights coming back on the crowd because it's turned to like show the crowd and i'm talking like everywhere man it's the most beautiful scene and actually if you go on sabaton's facebook page after the london show one of the pictures on there is that guitarist from behind him standing there with his hands on his head looking out at all the lights oh and cool. looking like immensely emotional uh, and then, yes, obviously, Christmas Truce are played. Yeah, I figured it was going to be that, yeah. But it was just full of, like, beautiful moments, right? You know, um, they went off, they did a proper encore. They went when off. You say pro- I read this. What did you mean by that? They didn't come back straight back out. The lights went off. The, light, oh, the lights went off and started coming up. They were gone. Uh, and they were gone for, I would say, six, seven minutes. I don't know if people can see that. There you go. That's what Brendan's yeah, the, talking the about. Part yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's quite it's quite a like powerful picture, right? It is. It's very, it's very immense looking, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And he um yeah so like a uh, six seven minutes of them being gone, didn't come back out. Crowd cheering Sabaton Sabaton <laughs> over and over. Foot stomping became a thing. I didn't know this was a thing. Everyone in every seat and on down on the floor all just doing their feet. Nice. Then then back to Sabaton and then they came back out again after about six seven minutes and I was like that's like a that's an old school encore, right? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, I wonder if we hadn't a chanted, would they have come back out? Like, I'm assuming they would have still, but they were just hoping you'd chant, right? Because they That's still, it. You know, but luckily everyone did. And like old school things, I know it sounds stupid to say old school, but things I remember from being at gigs when I was younger, you know, leaving the venue afterwards, all the way back to the train station as people are still doing this crowd sing-along bit to Swedish Pagans. Oh, yeah, back, yeah. On the tube. Uh, going back towards like to get the Elizabeth line, people on the tube after we way away from Wembley now, suddenly hearing somebody singing a bit of Christmas truth, like with a group of people on a train. And when we got all the way back to Slay Green, right, we just as we were getting off the train, we saw another couple wearing Sabaton shirts who then stopped to like ask if everyone had a, how did you have a good time talking to Rose and all that. And I was like, it's quite a special thing, right? <laughs> so musically great sounded phenomenal man they really really did you know uh rose losing her shit whenever tommy played guitar like in a spotlight went down on him and she was like imagine if he started playing the majestica song and it's like he's not gonna do that he's but not yeah. gonna do that yeah <laughs> uh, pretty cool but i think the rest of the band would be pissed with him <laughs> um every you know imagine a lot of pyro right a lot of confetti explosions going off in certain songs um good set list you know, nice balance of songs, like big kind of classics, like, you know, Prima Victoria, Winged Hussars, all that sort of stuff with some stuff that are, even I wasn't always familiar with from maybe quite early albums. Mm-hmm. Um, then uh, I guess theatrical performance, right? Because every song had a thing and that's the thing. Like it was almost like you're watching the band. They've got all sandbags everywhere you know barbed wire the tank is obviously there the look of it yeah yeah platforms up and they're always on the move it's very engaging to watch you know like just constantly running back and forward along the stage joking with each other like uh while um wakim was trying to sing at one point the two guitarists were standing directly behind him and kept like doing things to the back of his head and he was trying to like he was like trying to sing and then kind of walked off half laughing half singing and they're just just literally looking like they're having a blast right um and every like i said everything kind of themed you know one song i can't remember the song i'm sure there's a particular song why it's this but um there's like people in nazi uniforms and lab coats walking around on the stage with a whiteboard trying to invent like poisonous gas and at the end of the song the whole thing kind of blows up and there's green smoke comes up everywhere from the stage the band come back out for the next song wearing gas masks like do you know what i mean it was Uh, and it's just like yeah okay these guys i think have firstly done something that i found to be immensely clever you know, you want to make a mark. You want to come over here. And I think they wanted it from a personal reason. I think they wanted to sell out Wembley Arena. I think it was like a personal thing. 20-year anniversary of being in London, all that sort of stuff. Lower the ticket price, bring big bands, 40 quid, you know, and then give them something to fucking remember. And I just come out of that just thinking, like, this band can't ever play lower than headline special guest slots in the UK now, surely. I would imagine, it depends on the festival, but I'd imagine yeah, headline yeah. will be most cases now, really. Um, but of course, uh, arena sized bands, you know, that's the direction that Downard is looking, has to look in as well. So don't be surprised then if uh, this if this is successful, the tour overall is successful enough of that Sabaton's future next time around as well. That's, yeah. we've seen it happen. Yeah, absolutely. But so yeah, gig like, of the year. 
Yeah, gig of the year for me so far. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I just like I said, for me, what would I e easy in hindsight? If you'd have said to me beforehand, before going right, I would have still expected Sabaton to put on a very, very good show. Yes. I wouldn't. I'd be expecting it to be eights, nines, and tens. That's the truth of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. It's very could be very difficult for them to play like a catalog that I don't like some songs in or, or anything yeah, like yeah. that, you know. So, you know, what 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 do I value that gig at to see Sabaton at Wembley Arena? And like that to me is a 60, 70, 80 quid show. Now, if I love the two bands that are with it, it's possibly a you know more. <laughs> you know, so or, or maybe I'm comfortable at 70 quid. So, you know, 40 quid and then just the money that I saved on that, I just spent on their merch instead. So yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, you've certainly spent so much there. All right, what else has been going on? Got any other things to share? You've been doing, been up to, been going on, been enjoying, been hating? No, I mean, I'm, I'm still struggling a bit for time due to work commitments and that, so I haven't really been listening to as much music as I'd like to normally do. I think I kind of get to the point, you know, like especially if we're planning to do videos and I'm like, I can't, I can't really listen to too much new this week because I need to listen to the stuff for the track by track. And I'm kind of yeah. often, you know, balancing off between them. So, you know, I think I listened to, what did I do? I listened to a, a, a an album from a band called Dimwind. Okay, yeah. Which, um, yeah. which I particularly enjoyed, thought it was really, really cool, full instrumental, but very emotive, very emotional and yeah, really, really cool. So that was nice. I managed to get like a, a new album in there. Um, I think that comes out on Friday. Tomorrow, yeah. Yeah, that's called The Futility of Breathing. Uh, but yeah, aside from that, that's pretty much it. I've been working, looking forward to some events coming up and uh, trying to... Actually, I'll tell you what I am trying to do at the moment, but it doesn't. I, I can't actually tell you the answer to it. Um, I'm trying to get my daughter at the moment to draft her bucket list for bands she'd like to see so that I can keep an eye out for tickets right. for it. And um, we ran into some problems straight away. In that the first four or five bands that she put on were bands like, say, Ghosts of Atlantis. Um, and I'm like, ah, uh, are they going to be in playing in a place with an upstairs? Hopefully they will in a couple of years' time. But, mm. you know, and she was like, oh, I'd like to see... Because she listens to bands that I listen to, and she's like, oh, I'd like to see War 16. I'd like to see, um, you know, Ghosts of Atlantis. Uh, mom said we should go she we should check out red method and it's just like oh, i don't think we're gonna quite be able to go to these ones just yet because not mostly, yet yeah <laughs> unless they're supporting somebody you know but then you don't want to kind of pay for... well i'll still go and see them i think but yeah so i've had to get her to redo her bucket list and and say right okay so we'll have that Bigger, one bucket arena list. bands come on yeah. yeah yeah so she so far she's come back with one which was pathway drive so she but she's working on it so that's no bad. That's no bad. Parkway Drive is an easy one there, an arena band, or at least a, a, a big venue with upstairs yeah. and so on. Yeah. Well, they will yeah, be, but... get all these fuckers out of Valley Pally because that's the only problem. A lot of them are coming over playing Alexandria Palace, don't they? Do they, these... have an... they don't do they have, have an upstairs, age thing? They? It's just the open uh, floor. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. Ali Pali is the current popular one. It's the neck. It's like the in between, isn't it? It's not Brixton size, mm, yeah. but it's not Wembley. Yeah. Yeah, I've been busy all week working uh, early. It's back to end tomorrow morning, thankfully. But I've had an interview pretty much every night. At least one interview every night this week. It's been a, it's been up and down. Not because of bands like bad yeah. or anything like that. Um, you know, I found my rhythm these days with interviews. And uh, you know, without blowing my own trumpet, I think I kill it personally. Um, but yeah, like uh, I think. Oh God, I, I talked to Tombs. Uh, T O T W O. MS, the Irish uh, band who were bloodstock last year. I talked to them and man, oh man, did we have connection issues galore through that. And right. today I was with uh, Through Fire, uh, an American band. And that is again, a really choppy connection issue one as well. Um, and so on. But beyond that, it's been pretty cool. Dream Slain uh, bailed their incineration fest as well. It's just yep. lots and lots of videos. We've got another one tomorrow. May have some next week, depending upon shifters as well. And really, I'm just trying to get through to May. I've got like bugger all going on for our April, aside from like drinks here and there. And then like May is when it all kind of kicks in. I've got like two weeks off work. So, and originally we were going to be going away, but we're not now. And then it was kind of like, okay, well, what can we fill in that blanks there? And it's like, let's look around. Let's look around at what keeps going on. And as yeah. you said at the very start of this video, it's like, yep. Yeah, you're not shorting them. You're not shorting them. You just got to pick and go. Right, this yeah. one. And sometimes there's several in the same day. Um, and it's like, okay, well, I'm going to have to pick one of them. Which one am I going to yeah. do? That. 
Uh, what else? Yeah, obviously, no secret. Went to see Evil Dead Rise early, uh, yes, about a week ago in uh, the Prince Charles Cinema with a sort of directness Q and A. It was like we were going in, we're joined the queue, we're going in, and Lou's like, "Is that the director? You reckon?" And I was like, "I don't know who the director is. I didn't look. I don't know. I wouldn't recognize him." So we walked past some dude sort of standing at the door, awkwardly sort of standing there, like you know, as people are filing past him. And we were in the we're in the venue, and they're like, "Oh, we're going to introduce the movie. Here's the director," and it's him. <laughs> I was like, "Ah, oh, man, no, you know, should look it up. He would have been like the only cool person to know the director." Oh, yeah. But yeah, so he did a little introduction, obviously, uh, you know, the review um, yeah. and uh, sort of live stream I did uh, about it afterwards, talking about it. You know, I absolutely loved it. The reason why I'm bringing it up is purely is because, folks, it's out on the 21st of April, fully in theatres, in cinemas. And I, I wouldn't normally do this because I don't necessarily think we at size can offer any help, promotion and so on and stuff like that. Yeah. But I do think we know our shit about horror. And I will tell people, look, go see this film. Uh, I was surprised by quite, even though it's got like Studio Canal um, yeah. backing to a certain degree, this is not uh, an expensive movie and it's going to need to make a shit ton of money for this to be a success. Like it's going to make, for it to be considered a success by those involved. So that's kind of what I'm hoping is like, make sure you go check this bad boy out. Do give yeah, it a go. I've seen a lot of positive press about it, like across mm. the board, actually. I don't think I've seen anything negative about it at all, so. Yeah, and I hate cinemas. And uh, you know, I fucking hate. I hate cinemas. It's one of the most. Worst I went to the cinema. You just reminded me. I went to the cinema last. When did I go? Friday. Did you see Super Mario Brothers? I did. Yeah. Of course you did. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. Three D as well, mate. In a big recliner. Oh really? Okay. But yeah, well, was I... was it filled with obnoxious people? No, it's pretty empty to be honest. I went about oh. ten thirty in the morning with my daughter, so it's probably a good time to go. Um, you know. So half term and it's another of the kids even are out of bed and parents are all still bumming around the house in their pajamas and all that. So I was like, let's get down there, blue water, let's get out there as quick as we can after <laughs> before the masses descend upon it and uh, go and check it out. So I thought it was all right. It was good fun. Oh, I mean, oh, good. No, nah, I didn't think it was good. I thought it was all okay. right. But like, you know, Rose enjoyed it more. Um, I, I don't know. Like, I just like it, it's so full of like just it's like the film's forced to be oh let's keep dropping like um easter eggs in all the way through like that, that's right. kind of what it does you know which is fun and all that sort of stuff the only thing i i but part of it that I, I thought was like absolutely hilarious was there's a point when they're all like caught in cages hanging above like a lava pit and all that and there's just this really depressed star like properly depressed and they're all trying to be optimistic and get out of this and he just kept they'd turn around and say stuff like there's no point we're all hurtling towards the inevitable void of death. And I, and I thought that stuff was just hilarious because it was like this proper like little cutesy, you know, sparkling star, but just on the verge of death, <laughs> you know. So, but yeah, aside from that, it was, it was just a, it's a fun, it's fun, I guess. You never watch it again. Like, do you know what I mean? It's not the sort of film you go like, oh, I have to buy that and watch that three more times this year. It's like, yep, yeah, seen that. Move on. I'll probably check it out when it eventually turns up like a whole premiere and so on. It's simply the the thought of going to the cinema at most times fills me with a level of dread um, because, <laughs> you know, in my opinion, people are obnoxious and they've turned that experience into they're at, like they're at home uh, and they yeah. treat other people and the place like shit. Uh, so the idea of doing it when it would be a kid's film, just yeah. it sends my blood cold. I'm saying to my wife, I was like, can't they just do adult only screenings? Because like normally when we do go see a film. <laughs> well, for kids movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, but normally when we do a film, we'd wait like two or three weeks till it's out and then we would pick like one of the latest nights possible and then on a random Monday or a Tuesday. So like it would be like, that's how we saw Scream yeah, 6 yeah. in the cinema <clears throat> and it was like three people in there with us and they were still fucking dicks as well. Yeah. In a big, you know, it's just, um, that's why I just can't, I, I, it's, you know, it's a personal thing. It makes me uncomfortable. So I don't like to do it. Yeah, I'm not mm. a huge fan of them myself. Uh, most I think they're very, very no, because I know to be fair, like the movies themselves aren't actually that extortionately expensive. It's just the rest of the cinema that is, you know, you want to drink. Well, we yeah. don't do normal sized drinks, but you can have like a super sized fucking American Coke. Like, yeah, but I just want a small one. It's like, no, we do extra large or extra, extra large. And and it's like, okay, and how much is that? And it's like eight pounds fifty or whatever. You're yeah. Like, well, hang on, that's the same price as the fucking movie. <laughs> you know. 
but beyond that, elsewhere, um, me and Damon have started. We're going to have started uh, probably a time this video goes out. Castlevania, we're running through Castlevania, wow, the right. Netflix TV series now, as uh, Halo ended, The Last of Us ended. So we're like, well, which one's next? Castlevania has four seasons. I've already seen them and I really enjoyed it. So it's like, but he hadn't. It's like, okay, this would be cool. You've seen Castlevania? I watched some of it, but I'm not that big on the lore of Castlevania either, to be honest with you. So I didn't really mind the shows, but I didn't really get like the same level of enjoyment, I think, as you probably would have. Yeah, we're also doing uh, the Viva Pinata TV show. Which, oh, uh, aired, it was one. <laughs> exactly, right? It aired in like Random. 2006, uh, but in, like 10 <laughs> minute shorts. Like 10 minutes short, similar to Donkey Kong Country, that where it's like an yeah. animated TV show and there's like 52 episodes. It's oh. like it ran for a while. At least they're short though. Imagine it was hour long. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. But yeah, I think that's about it. I think we'll call time in this video. We don't just keep rambling on trying to come up with stuff. Yes, that's our update. You got any thoughts you want to share with us? You got any thoughts on what we've talked about here? You know what to do. Let us know in the comments. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked what you saw, please help us out by giving us a thumbs up and hitting that subscribe button. If you really liked what you saw, consider donating to keep the website and channel running by buying us a coffee via our coffee page or picking up some merch from our big cartel store. You can check us out on gbhbell.com as well as via our social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as listen to our interviews via SoundCloud, Apple Music, and Spotify. Just search for GBHBL games, horror, and heavy metal. What else is life for?